Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm thrilled to have you here and I can't wait to share the new knowledge. I'm going to talk about gingival cord retraction and why it is important for restorative dentistry and also how I do it in my clinical practice. So what is the need for gingival retraction? Now any restoration that you do, whether it is a crown, whether it is a onlay or a veneer, we need gingival tissue to be healthy. Secondly, we also need our tissue to be captured well while we are doing our impressions or scanning. Now coming on to the important topic of gingival retraction, there are a few things to remember. Number one, why do we need it? So we need it for capturing the margins of our preparation clearly. Number two, we need it to control the hemorrhage. We need to control the gingival cavicular fluid so that that doesn't interfere with the setting of our impression material or interferes with the proper capture of the margin when we are scanning the preparation. So these are the two main reasons why we do retraction. It is important being a general dentist, being a prosthodontist or being a restorative dentist to be able to master the technique of retraction cords so that in all the cases that you do, you are able to apply the trick. So let's just dive in and see what are the techniques, what are the methods, how we do the retraction, so on and so forth. Now in the market, there are many ways that are available that will help you in retraction. What I personally use in my practice is the retraction cords. Other methods that are available are retraction paste. You can do it with a laser. You can do it with an electro cautery. There are many ways to do it. What I rely on is the retraction cords. Now retraction cords are available basically in different ways. Now they are classified based on the number that is the number the thickness and also the kind that they are. So they can be knitted, they can be twisted and they can be braided. Twisted cords are not used that much. Uh, the main cords that are generally available are the braided and the knitted cords. Again, the one that I use in my practice are the knitted cords. The reason for using knitted cords is that they are expandable. So when you dip them into an astringent, they expand, they absorb the material and also when you push them in the tissue, they are able to cause a proper retraction. Now a retraction needs to be at least 0.2 millimeters so that that thickness is good enough for the impression material to go in and to come out without being torn. Now how do you classify a good retraction cord? So a good retraction cord generally is a knitted cord. It is biocompatible. It should be of a contrasting color so that when you are packing it, you are able to visualize if the cord is packed or it is not packed. And thirdly, you don't forget to remove it. Now that is something that I have seen many times. Even in my practice, I had a case where I got a patient having severe gingival inflammation. And when I looked at the case, there was a retraction cord that was left in the sulcus by a dentist that did a procedure on that particular tooth. So remember to always take the cord out before you send the patient back home. Secondly, the gingiva is, can be of different types. It can be of a thick gingival biotype. It can be of a thin gingival biotype. Now, when it is a thick gingival biotype, the tissue thickness is generally two or more millimeters. It is the gingiva where the cords work the best. It is easy to put in and it doesn't create much problems while you are packing the cords in. Whereas in thin gingival biotype, the tissue is thin. You have to be extremely careful how when you are packing the cords and also you have to use a very fine instrument so that you can pack the cord in without causing any injury to the tissue. What is the right force to pack the cords in? So one Newton per millimeter square is the force that a gingiva can tolerate well. Whereas any force greater than 2.5 Newton per millimeter square can cause injury. How do we check it? Try to put a cord packer instrument in between the nail bed and your thumb and you will realize the amount of pressure that you can tolerate. Try to apply a little bit less than that when you are trying to pack the cord in. There are different techniques to do cord packing. There is a single cord technique. There is a double cord technique. What I like to use in my practice is the double cord technique. Another thing that you will need is some kind of a hemostatic agent. Initially, adrenaline was used as a hemostatic agent, but studies have shown that it can cause something called as adrenaline shock and we don't want that to happen. It is said that in one inch of cord dipped in adrenaline, it, can, it has got 50 times more adrenaline than in a single cartridge of your local anesthesia. So when you are using adrenaline for your hemostat, ideally you shouldn't, but if you are using, you have to be very careful. Don't use it for more than one or two teeth. The best thing that you can use is aluminum chloride. That's the best astringent. That is generally what I use, 15 to 20% aluminum chloride. I don't use ferrous sulfate anymore because it's brown in color. It can cause some staining of the tissue. It can cause staining of your restorations. So I try to avoid using ferrous sulfate as my astringent. So the astringent of choice is going to be aluminum chloride. Let's dive in the procedure and see how I do it. 
So what do you need for cord packing? Let's have a look at the armamentarium that I use. So you have the cord packing instrument. It can be serrated, it can be non-serrated, depends on the kind of cord that you use. If you're using a knitted cord and if you're using a serrated instrument, there is a chance that when you're packing the cord in and you are removing the instrument, the cord comes out with it. See, whichever works best for you, you can use that when you are actually doing your cord packing. But I use a serrated cord packer. I can always use a spoon excavator if you don't have a cord packer but the thinner spoon excavator, the better it is. So that's the one thing, I should have a straight probe. Second, I should have a cement spatula or a plastic instrument to help me in kind of holding the cord in, in places where sometimes the cord keeps coming out. I use aluminum chloride from Ultradent, which is called Viscostat. I love it, it's a great product when you use it. It again depends uh, what is available in wherever you are practicing, but try to look for aluminum chloride and not for any other astringent when you're doing your cord packing. You should have a scissor and of course the patient whom you have done the crown preparation on. A tip here that if you are doing cord packing for multiple teeth, suppose you have done 10 veneer preparation, I like to use a single long cord rather than strips of small cords. But again, it's a personal preference. You can decide on whatever you would want to use. How do I decide what is the exact length of cord that I need? Many times you would have seen that when you ask your assistant for the cord, they will give you either a very long piece of cord or a very short piece of cord. Is there any way that you can use to check the exact amount of cord that you need without causing a lot of wastage? So the thing that I personally like to use is the finger wrap technique. So I wrap it around my finger. When you wrap it around the finger, the amount of cord that comes in is the exact amount of cord that you would need for a molar. If you're doing for a central incisor, lateral incisor, you can take a little less than that, little more than that. Again, it is not a huge wastage. And also it will not be suddenly you're packing and the cord is short. The cords that I like to use are from Ultradent. They are knitted cords. My favorite numbers are triple zero, double zero and zero. Number one, two and three, I hardly use them. It's good to have them in your inventory, but even if you don't have them, it's fine. But triple zero, double zero and zero, triple zero and double zero are my favorite cords. Once we have decided on the exact length of cord that we need and I have cut the length for the triple zero and double zero, I take a drop of my astringent. Once I have a drop of my astringent, I'll just dip my cords in that astringent, rub them nicely in that, and then take a tissue and dab them. Now we need to make sure that you don't have excess of your aluminum chloride on your cords. We don't want that. We just need the cords to be moist with aluminum chloride. How do we do the cord packing? Now to do the cord packing, it's best to make a loop. We loop it around the tooth in a way that it is held by the lingual or the parallel side of the tooth. And the first area that you would try to do the packing is the interproximal area. Because the interproximal area is the easiest for the cord to go in and stay there. So that's generally where I start with. Again, it depends on wherever you would want to do it. I start with an, any interproximal area, put my cord in. Once the initial part of the cord is inside, I don't have to worry much. The whole process then becomes a little easier. You have to start from one end and slowly pack the cord in total and anything excess we cut it. So the first cord that goes in is the triple zero cord. The function of that cord is to provide the vertical displacement. It is generally not providing a lot of retraction. It is providing a vertical displacement of my tissue. The second cord that comes on top of it is the thicker cord, which is the double zero or zero based on the tissue that I'm going to pack the cord in. And the function of that cord is to give us the retraction, which is the horizontal retraction, which should ideally be more than 0.2 millimeters. So these are the two forces that generally act vertically and outward. But there are two other forces that we need to remember, which is the collapsing force and then the pressure that is applied by the impression material. So the moment you remove the cord, the tissue starts to collapse. The time that takes for the tissues to collapse is less than 20 seconds. So we need to make everything ready before the cord is pulled out. Once you pull out the cord, we have to make sure that the impression material goes into the mouth within 20 seconds. If it cannot go within 20 seconds, the tissue collapse. And finally, the moment you put the impression material in the mouth, there is a chance that the material is going to push the sulcus inside. I generally prefer using a single step technique, putty and light body. These days I have moved on to more of scanning my preparations. So I know that there is no collapsible force from the impression material that is going to act on my tissue. The ideal time to leave the cord in the sulcus is around three to five minutes. 
If you leave it for a very long time, there are chances of permanent tissue injury and some amount of gingival recession happening. That becomes more important when you are doing a full mouth retraction so that you don't end up in keeping the cord for a very long time in one particular part of the mouth. Once the cord is placed, you are ready with your impression. The cord is removed. I generally remove only the outer cord. The inner cord remains as it is. I make my impression. The impression comes out. I examine it under my naked eyes or I have a magnifying glass just to look for the uniform flash around my margin. The idea is to capture the non-prepared part of the tooth so that the technician can have a proper emergence profile for your restoration. Once the cords are removed, make sure that you rinse the area properly. If aluminum chloride is left, it can cause some tissue damage and when the patient comes next week or whenever for the final bonding, there might be some amount of gingival irritation. So that's all about double cord technique. I use a triple zero, I use a double zero, I use aluminum chloride from Ultradent as my uh, preferred astringent and then life becomes easy. Don't forget to not do retraction because if you are not doing retraction, you are missing out on a lot of details that can be given to the technician. You are missing out on good fluid management. You are missing out on capturing good margins. So to conclude, gingival retraction is an integral part of restorative dentistry. If you don't do it, start now. If you have been doing it, try the double cord technique. And if you're already doing the double cord technique, you are already doing the right thing. Thank you again for subscribing to my channel. I'm looking forward to seeing you in my next videos. And I hope you like this. Do comment, do like, do subscribe to my channel and I hope to see you all soon again.